My name is Darren Gallipo and today what I'll be talking about is our Xenia microservices platform and then I'll pass it off to Andy Cooper who will be discussing how that uh, Xenia microservices platform is used in our live playout uh, solutions. Okay, so first off we want to start with a little bit of context of what microservices are. Uh, and then we'll kind of delve into how we make use of a microservices architecture within the Xenium platform. And then we'll move into a live demonstration. The live demonstration should take the bulk of this session, but we want to add a little bit of context here uh, before we get into that. So first off, what are microservices? So essentially what microservices are is a suite of uh, small discrete components that are typically represented in a larger monolithic application. So the concept here is that you break down functionality that would be typically uh, embedded within a big black box appliance or perhaps monolithic application, and you isolate those functionalities in discrete processes, each with a discrete and isolated processing functionality. So take, for example, the case of a linear encoder. This linear encoder might actually bring down a signal, might actually bring in and demultiplex that signal, might decode it, might then re-encode it and then mux it and then send it back out over broadcast. That would be a sort of traditional linear transcoder operation. So the problem with that is that what you end up seeing is the ins and outs of that big black box with a couple of knobs and uh, dials that allow you to configure it, but you don't really see the inner workings of that linear transcoder. A microservices style approach modifies this. They change it up so that what you do is you isolate each of those component functionalities into discrete processes. This means that you have a lot more flexibility, you have a lot more visibility, and you have a lot more efficiency opportunities in that particular workflow. So take for example the case of the encoder component within that linear transcoder. Typically if we want to add or modify that particular encoder technology, we have to break down that big monolithic application and we may might need to make modifications to that monolithic application and then recompile it and bring it into a big monolithic build and send that out. Those types of modifications are very expensive to do. They are very risk prone to do. In a microservices style architecture, you instead simply swap out that loosely coupled uh, H.264 encoder and you can bring in, for example, an HEVC encoder. So it's a lot more flexible and it's a lot safer of an architecture. So what is Xenium and how does this pertain to microservices? So in fact, we consider Xenium to be a pure microservices platform. What this exists is a, a collection of isolated modules, each representing technologies that pertain to our media uh, and broadcast uh, environment. So for example, we might have an AVC encoder module, we would have a transport stream module, we might have a 2110 module, and this spans a very wide range of different processing functionality that we use within our uh, media processing world today. In fact, we have a very large collection of components, well over a thousand, that are used in various ways in various different product applications today. So you might see this term powered by Xenium. This is our sort of Intel inside. It's the ingredient branding that says that when a product that you have is powered by Xenium, it's powered by this microservices architecture. This sort of ensures that those products and solutions based on the Xenium platform can be updated and uh, can be modified in a very flexible fashion. Xenium is not actually a new platform for us. This has actually been around five plus years and is represented in multiple different products that span multiple different functionality. So for example, we have linear encoder uh, solutions with Selenio Flex Live and Selenio One. We have file-based processing solutions with Selenio Flex File. We have multi-viewers with our Epic Multi-Viewer. We have broadcast playout servers with our Versio uh, platform solution. These are all different products that are powered by the underlying Xenium framework and harness those different modules in different ways to create a particular processing flow. And so how do they do that? Well, what they do is they look at this catalog of components, and I mentioned that there's well over a thousand of these components in existence today. We chain them together to produce a particular what we call blueprint, which is really just a definition of how those components are connected together. We might chain some of those blueprints together and create a product out of it. On top of which we put a control plane, usually a user interface and some automation to control all of that. So this is how we would generally 
uh, implement a virtualized product development based on or powered by that Zenium platform. This is actually very similar to a microservices style approach. And you can see how it's analogous to that. Essentially, in a microservices approach, you do the exact same thing. You have separate components that you build together to create microservices. You might chain those microservices together in something called a service train. And then you would have an orchestration layer on top to coordinate the activities of those in underlying uh, uh, microservices. So behind all of this is a continuous deployment mechanism. What this means is that there's a framework within the Xenium uh, architecture that allows you to update those components and dynamically deploy them across your operational infrastructure without having to do big builds and reinstalls. These updates can happen continuously. They can happen on a day-by-day -day basis, on a module-by-module -module, uh, uh, basis, leveraging what we refer to as our repository or our supply chain mechanism. And I'm going to show you a couple examples of how we leverage the Xenium platform to achieve this. So let's start with a very simple example. We're going to take a live transport stream source, and we're going to simply connect two different components together. So this component here is simply an RTP source. Its sole functionality is to access multicast traffic that exists on the network and bring that multicast traffic into the Xenium framework. You can see here I'm accessing this particular multicast address, and then I'm writing it out to a file. And its sole functionality is to take whatever's coming on the input pin and write that out to disk. And so what we have now is a live ingest solution. Typically, this type of operation would be built into one of our big capture appliances, and they'll still have a function, but this sort of microservices style architecture means that it's very dynamic and very portable, and you can see this is made up of just two components to create what is essentially a live ingest and capture solution. But let's make this a little bit more complicated. Let's actually instead introduce a preview function. So what we're going to do to do that preview is we're going to take that multicast feed and we're going to demux it. And we're doing this with the use of an MPEG-2 TS demuxer component. We'll take the results of that and we'll decode the video using a video decoder component. Again, these are all isolated components that exist in completely isolated, compiled, and version controlled components within the ecosystem. These are not different components of the same monolithic application. And I'll step back in a second to sort of show you exactly what I mean by that. And then we can bring in a preview. And this preview is simply taking in those uncompressed frames that come off the decoder and previewing them to screen. Now, if we encounter an error, maybe we're missing something inside of this blueprint, we'll get these error messages. And so it's telling me, I don't have a clock source, so we need to time it. Well, we provide those clock sources. We can bring that in, and then now there's timing inside of this blueprint. So we can run that. And you can see that it's actually doing a live capture, demux, decode, and preview to screen. Okay, now let's make this a little bit more complicated. Rather than just being a live preview to screen, let's change this into a live transcode to file. And we're going to do that by leaving those same components in place, and instead of just bringing it to preview, we're going to bring in this H.264 video encoder and connect it to the chain. We're going to bring in a transport stream multiplexer. Oops. Connect that to and then bring out a file component. And then running this again, it's still doing the preview, but in addition to doing the preview, we're now transcoding it into H.264, muxing it into a transport stream and writing it out to disk. And all we've done to achieve that additional functionality is bring in three more components to the mix. So it's a very flexible and modular architecture that's extensible to achieve multiple different product applications. That's precisely how we use it. We create different products by bringing these various components together in different ways. But we do it on a platform that allows us to be very flexible, allows it to be deployed in a large range of different infrastructures. It can be deployed on bare metal, it can be deployed on a virtual machine, it can even be deployed on a container technology such as Docker. It has been proven across all of those deployment infrastructures. So these have been live workflows, but let's change it up and actually transition this to more of a file-based workflow. Okay, 
So we're going to build it up in exactly the same way we did before. In this case, instead of having a transport stream, we're going to bring in a media source. And this component is responsible for accessing a file on disk and bringing in the necessary components such as uh, decoders and demuxers that are necessary to access the uncompressed video and audio. We'll bring in the AVC encoder. We'll bring in a transport stream muxer just like we did before. And then we'll write this out to disk. And maybe I'll bring in a preview just so you can sort of see how that's working. And it's the exact same type of architecture, but in this case, what we've produced is a file transcoding solution. And it's the exact same TS muxer that's being used in that live transcoding solution. It's the exact same <clears throat> H.264 encoder and file output component that we used in some of those previous workflows. We've just switched some of the inputs and outputs, but it still benefits from that, that modular architecture. Now, some of these are sort of basic workflows to sort of showcase, but some of our products actually create some very um, ambitious and complicated workflows because that's what the feature or the uh, product is looking to achieve. But let's scale this down to a much, much simpler workflow. I'm going to connect two components together. This was a topic that came up as we were setting up this booth. What's running throughout our entire uh, booth infrastructure here is multicast traffic, but we had a need to take that multicast traffic and send it up to the cloud. The cloud doesn't accept multicast traffic in most scenarios. <clears throat> so what we did is we took a multicast RTP source component and we connected it to a UDP unicast component. And in this way, what we're doing is doing a translation between that RTP multicast and that UDP unicast. And we did this and just left it running within our pod to facilitate that particular workflow and demo. But it kind of occurred to us as we were looking at this that what this really amounts to is effectively a DA. And we can achieve this by simply connecting these components together like so. And so now we have what's effectively an IP-based distribution amplifier in a pure software mode. And all we did was connect a small subset of components together. And the thing about it is that we can actually deploy just these components if we want to create a solution or a microservice that does exactly this. So let's take a look at the graph requirements. You can see that there's 17 components that are making up this particular workflow. So let's switch this out. It's actually got some additional ones. I'm going to give myself an even more basic blueprint. Bring those back in. And we've only got 13 components. That other one was specific to transcoding workflow. So within this environment, there's only 13 plugins that are necessary to achieve this. Well, in addition to this design and test environment that you're seeing in front of you, I'd mentioned that there's a uh, deployment and repository management. So a lot of the demos that we've been showcasing today use this large collection of plugins. In this particular case, there's 387, each representing a discrete functionality. But that previous workflow where we just look at the live RTP to UDP, that DA functionality represented here, we've created a customized partition that just contains those 13 components. You can sort of see in the bottom, well, maybe you can see in the bottom right-hand corner that there's only 13 components that are making up. You can actually instantiate an instance of Xenium with just these components. And you can say, that's going to be my new microservice. So it's a customized solution that's based on that Xenium platform. OK, so at this point, I am going to hand off presentation to Andy. OK, so um, like Darren said, um, we use the Xenium framework in a lot of the products. So first thing I'm going to do is give you an overview of what some of those products are and how they do that. So uh, Versio Ingest. So this is one of those workflows that is able to take a number of different streams, whether that's compressed or uncompressed, and basically do very similar to what uh, Darren just demonstrated and encode that to a file. So that's just one example. Playout. That's the, what I am the product manager for. So this does the same thing. Um, we'll dive into this a bit later. Um, but you can see it's more advanced. We're now looking at um, compressed and uncompressed inputs and outputs. We're looking at um, DVE, scaling, um, audio track routing, closed caption insertion, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll dive into that in a minute and look at the uh, live blueprint once we've covered this slide. 
Transcoding. We have a lot of transcode products. So one of the things we use this for in the playout um, Versio platform is to generate these um, MPEG dash proxies so that we can have these little previews throughout our user interfaces so that we can get a real-time feedback of what we're actually putting out to air. And finally, another example is master control. So again, this is kind of like demonstrating how another product can actually talk to components inside the blueprint. So one of those microservices is an automation component accepting external control to then insert data such as SCSI triggers, captioning, and to reconfigure the audio track router to a certain configuration to give you a certain output. So that's just kind of scratching the surface there. Um, so what we're going to do now is look at the actual Versio architecture and where Xenium fits into an integrated playout solution. So we have a number of back-end services which are required for any integrated channel. Those are all um, indicated in yellow. So starting in the top left, you've got uh, obviously a web UI, which is a HTML5-based uh, interface. Uh, we have a uh, message broker, which handles all the message queuing between all the different modules we have. We obviously have a timecode service. Uh, we have a schedule service, and then the automation service actually sits on the playout server, which then listens to messages to say, play this clip out at this time. We have a number of other products which fit into this. So under the Versio platform, you also have Versio Content Portal, which is, which is our asset management. You have Versio Transcode, which generates those proxies. Versio Workflow, which uh, is, our, is Motion, which is our basically media transfer, you know, push to archive, push to cloud, ingest, QA workflows, things like that. You have Versio Master Control, which I mentioned, which is our virtual um, master control panel, which can take any multicast or compressed or uncompressed input and basically acts like a master control switcher. And then finally, Versio Graphics, which is the interface to actually driving the graphics in the integrated playout. Then how Xenium fits into this, um, basically, you have a workflow, which we'll look at in a minute. And so the whole area in white is what the Xenium framework is responsible for. So it's responsible for taking all those sources into this workflow from multicast, or even um, if you want to use baseband still, we have a hybrid option where you use a video card to take in the SDI sources, or you can use some of our other um, products to actually take SDI and do the conversion outside of the playout to take it to either compressed or uncompressed streams. But once you have those, you add a couple of media players, do all the video, audio, ancillary manipulation, and then finally decide where you want to send that whether that's going to be out to file, it can be out to a compressed transport stream or an uncompressed 2110, 2022, HLS. It really doesn't matter. That's up to you, and you can customize each one of these workflows for that particular channel and how you want that, to, that content to be delivered. So what we're going to do now, we're going to jump into a live demonstration, and we're going to actually connect to a channel, which I have on the system here. So I'm just going to remote desktop into this. And this is typically what you see on an integrated playout server. Um, the Xenium framework is generally launched um, by a service. So you don't get to see any of the pretty pictures and work for, you know, the components that Darren was showing you about. So in a production system, this is all you would see. But for the sake of this demo, and to show you what's under the hood as such, if I double click on this, we're then going to launch and bring up that live workflow right here on the desktop. So this is the blueprint we designed, or one of the blueprints we're using on the booth live today. And this blueprint is actually used to drive that monitor and a number of other things, including send all these presentations out live to the World Wide Web and a number of other destinations, which we'll look at in a minute. So on the input side, and these, these blueprints generally go from left to right, starting with all the inputs. So you can see here I have two Nexio sources. So these are our clip sources. And the reason we have two is so that we can do like DVEs. So you can do picture in picture or like squeeze and tease scenarios. We then have a, uh, in this case, a compressed input. So that's taking the feed from the cameras here and uh, the back of this wall here. It's uh, being converted to a transport stream. We're picking that up in this blueprint. And currently, we're switched to that source, and that's going live out to my destinations. 
So part of the blueprint, we have a router. This allows me to switch between all the sources. And the sources obviously could be 2022, 2110, and a number of other ones, depending on what your workflow is. We have a video and audio processing block. So this will handle all that processing. So the audio processor has an audio track router, which is responsible for shuffling the audio tracks. Uh, it can also do up and down mixing, audio normalization, and inserting um, watermarking, if required. The video processing block, if we expand that, it's got a few more groups of components underneath that. So we have a video fade, which is our transition engine. We have a video conversion. And again, if I expand that and go down to the lowest level here, we have an arc processor. So this is deciding if we should actually you know, stretch or squash the picture, insert letterbox or pillar box on it, depending on what size it is. And then we have video format converters to ensure that all my inputs match so that when I start overlaying these, either with DVEs or I overlay graphics, everything's in the same raster. Well, obviously, if you start overlaying HD and SD, things aren't going to look very good. Well, once it's done that, we send that to a DVE processing block, which has got scalars in there, so we can shrink the pictures and reposition them to do real-time uh, DVE processing. And we also insert graphics. In this case, this is our internal graphics engine. Uh, so we overlay that on top of uh, the output of the DVE block, and we can also change the Z ordering. So that's all inside the DVE processing block. And finally, on the output side, in this case, for this particular channel, we have a couple of encoders. First one's a 720p encoder at 4 megabits. The second one is a much lower resolution um, to be sent to the web at 600k. Uh, the audio is getting encoded by an AAC encoder component. So the low res one's going out to this component, which is a component we wrote um, to send HLS streams. And in this case, we have a chosen integration with a third party, one of our partners, Akamai. So we're sending it to one of their services, which is acting as our um, CDN. So we can then attach that to our web page. We can send it out on our Twitter feed. And everyone in the world can then watch what I'm doing up here on stage. We're then taking the slightly higher resolution, uh, or the bitrate um, stream. That's going out as a MPEG-2 multicast stream to our Epic MultiViewer. So that's appearing on our compressed network. We're also sending it as a unicast stream. So exactly the same stream. So we're just, we're just duplicating this. So this is essentially a DA. Another component here generating a low res, um, low frame rate uncompressed 2022-6 stream, which we use as the real-time proxies in all of our UIs. So even if, you're, even if you have a compressed workflow in a cloud, then you can use this and see a real-time update. So it's only going to be a, little, a small one, but uses very, very, um, doesn't use much bandwidth. So we can put those in our UI to give the operators confidence in real time what's happening rather than waiting for that delay on the return feed if you're using a compressed workflow. And then finally, this is kind of something I added this week. Uh, we had a press conference a couple of days ago, and somebody said, oh, we want to record this to a file. Easy. I just did exactly what Darren did here. We add a file com output component. We give it a name. We put that in what's called a injection graph, which is essentially a workflow within a workflow. But I can trigger this, start and stop it ad hoc. Now, I can do this manually, and that will record to the file. So I can actually record this entire session straight to file just by starting this workflow. We can also put in automation hooks so that it's triggered by automation to maybe do a secondary encode of a live event, for example. So it's pretty cool. And just to prove this is all live, what we can do is we can come back over here. We can bring up a preview component. We'll drop that in here. Just going to resize that and tell it to go on top. And I can take the video output from this compressed stream, put that in here, and in theory, it's me. Look at that. <laughs> I can also monitor the audio. And just to show you how powerful this is, what if I wanted to create another output, but maybe SD? What I can do is add a video format converter. So down here. We have a video format converter. 
I can bring that in here. I can bring another preview window in here. Put that on the end. Just make that a little smaller again. And then I can take my 720p output from here, put it into this video format converter, which is then, actually, before I do that, I need to set the properties of that. We're going to say, OK, I want a uh, NTSC bottom field first raster. I take my 20, uh, 720p output, I drop it on there, and now there's my SD output. And it automatically letterboxes it because it's now 4 by 3 so this is like you know this is just one example. Obviously, we use this to to configure um, the workflow for well, depending on your workflow. It can you know depending on what your inputs and outputs are, we can use and build these modules and modify these workflows without having to go through that huge development cycle, um, which is a risk, takes time. Uh, we could just simply load this into a designer, make the modifications required, change some properties, maybe change the multicast output, the port number, save that off. And that's it. There's your, there's your new workflow. All right. I think that's about done. Thank you very much.